So I would like to welcome you all to this technical session focusing on corruption and forest loss at the 10th session of the Conference of the State Parties to the United Nations Convention Against Corruption. This session is part of the special event, Action Now, Combating Corruption to Protect the Environment. We do have interpretation, as Maria uh, already mentioned. Uh, all you need to do is to scan your QR code on the slide, which will take you to the Zoom link, and you can select the language of your choice. So we have a great panel uh, today, and I'm looking forward to pro what promises to be an insightful discussion. To get, to get us underway, I would like to welcome uh, two gentlemen from Brazil. Um, this is Mr. Renato Madsen Aruda, who is a Federal Police General Coordination for the Protection of the Amazon, the Environment and Historical and Cultural Heritage. And Mr. Edson Fabio Garuti Moreira, Head of Institutional Coordination Unit at the Ministry of Justice and Public Security, Brazil. These two will share their insights uh, on the importance of institutional cooperation in tackling corruption related to environmental crimes. Welcome, gentlemen. The uh, floor is yours. This side. Okay, I'm okay. <laughs> Thank you, Ms. Marta. Thank you all for being here, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, the slides here play. OK. I'm Edson Garucci from Brazil. My colleague Renato is here also. We will present to you some insights of our country. Uh, I will initiate with these three forums that we have to integrate. Brazil is a big country, so we have to integrate areas every time. Every, every, every day it's our work to integrate areas of work. So we have three main forests to, to deal with this kind of issue, environmental issues. We have ENCLA, it's our national strategy against corruption and money laundering, ENCLA, the first one here. It was launched in 2003, so the same year as ANCAC. Okay, we have PPC Dam, uh, that's the action plan for the prevention and control of deforestation in the legal Amazon. Okay, the difference is the ANCLA is the national strategy anti corruption and anti money laundering. It produces public policy on these issues. And the PPC Dam is focus on environment, is an action plan with, uh, that I, I'll talk a little bit later. And we have AMAS. AMAS is the Amazon Security and Sovereignty Program. Uh, it's a program that produces the cooperation among the police in all states of Brazil. So I will start with PPC then, AMAS, and then a little bit about ANCLA. PPC done Action Plan for the Prevention and Control of Deforestation in the Legal Amazon, launched in 2004, now is in the fifth phase, 2023 to 2027, and have four thematic axes to guide government actions. First one, sustainable productive activities. Second, environmental and control. Third, territorial and land planning. And fourth, normative and economic instruments. Uh, there is 13 federal cabinets led by the Ministry of Environment and Climate Change that dialogue with environmental agencies of the nine states of legal Amazon, the region of Amazon. Okay, AMAS, it's the Amazon Security and Sovereignty Program, launched in 2023, this year. So it's an innovation that we are creating and implemented now and deal with public security actions to reduce violence in Amazon region, inclu including uh, all types of crimes, including environmental crimes. Uh, let's see. Yes, in 2024, the next year, we'll start an international police cooperation center in Manaus, the capital of Amazon state in Brazil, uh, where the police officers from the eight Amazon countries plan and will plan and execute public security actions among those 80 countries. So that's public security integration. 
and about the ANCLA, our national strategy against corruption and money laundering. It was launched in 2003. It's the main cooperation for against corruption and money laundering in Brazil that congregate more than 80 public agencies among executive, legislative, and judiciary branches. Uh, and also the prosecutors are in ANCLA. Uh, in, the, in previous years, some ANCLA actions carried out uh, specifically aimed to, uh, at corruption and money laundering related to environmental crimes. I will present just briefly for you the, the action three that continued to, through the years 2021, 22, and 23 deal with illegal mining, so gold traceability mechanism mitigation of asset laundering risks. And we are talking about asset laundering and not only money laundering because the gold is laundered. Okay. Uh, we produce a new regulatory framework for supervising compliance with money laundering prevention duties. An initial application of this new regulatory framework is doing right now. And the actions, actions 10 through the years 2021, 22, and also 23 uh, deals with the, the environment uh, in a broad perspective. So the actions 10 of those years produce recommendations to strengthen the fight against corruption and money laundering related to environmental crimes, a broad perspective and produces a diagnosis of fraud and corruption risks associated specifically with fraud in rural property records. So that's a, a, an overview that we are doing to integrate all the agencies in Brazil. And I'll give the floor to my colleague Renato to talk a little bit about federal police actions. Renato, please. Good morning, everyone. Uh, good morning, Mr. Mata, me, uh, my friends from the, the table here and everybody in this room. For me, it's a pleasure to be here. It's an honor because I'm dealing with environmental crime since 2011. So to be in this forum about corruption is, uh, I think that's a great evolution on this fight, getting everybody together in this, this combat. It's, it's very happy for me. Uh, I will talk a little, a little about the, the, uh, the operations that the federal police and all the agencies do together. Uh, but um, actually, uh, as my friend uh, Garut said, Brazil is a huge country, is a continental country, that, as we used to say. And we have enough area to cultivate agriculture and to raise livestock. We don't need more deforestation. It's the first message that I would like to, to say to you. And also the wood market have, uh, has a lot of sustainable techniques to supply itself. Uh, so they don't need also uh, deforestation. So we must be aware and say it for everybody and sometimes loud, nobody, no companies needs more deforestation. Deforestation uh, has not been done by traditional people or indigenous people that live in the Amazon. Actually, our investigation can show that there are a lot of huge companies that are encouraging and financing this kind of crime. They just look for money. We are talking about uh, organized crime. We are calling environmental organized crime. So they are looking for money as all kinds of organized crime. So uh, in our investigation, we are always arresting people and doing some, some uh, 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 charges, but we are always looking for the money. We are looking for the assets and recover these assets. Uh, we have some, some numbers here from the last years. And this year, this year, 2023, we have already uh, detected more than $1.5 and $1 billion that the, the organized crime have, has, uh, has profit this year. And we have order, judicial order, to size everything, every type, type of assets to, to repair the, the damage.
Uh, and we do it with a lot of technology. Uh, we use a lot of uh, satellite images and uh, artificial uh, intelligence that show us a lot of alerts of deforestation. We, we deal with, uh, we do it with a lot of agents. We are cooperation every time, every day with IBAMA, that's uh, in the, in the most important environmental agency in Brazil. And the, the problem that we have with corruption is that when, the, when a, a company receives a license to, to, to do some uh, logging and it's, uh, it's not, uh, it's not uh, observing the sustainable rules, they, they mix the legal and the illegal timber. So it becomes more difficult sometimes, often, uh, impossible to separate, to distinguish the illegal and the legal. So it's like we see in the laundry money. So we are talking here about laundry, the assets, like Garut said the, uh, about the gold. Uh, they are trying to, to be, oh, thank you. It's, they try to, to, to do not allow the, force, uh, the law enforcement to, us, to size it and to recover to the, the assets to the patrimony. So some images that have done in some operations. And uh, as we know, most of the the, the timber come to, to the other countries. So this forum is very important for us to call you all to this fight and not just the countries, but the, 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 sec the third sector, the, the NGOs and everybody in this room. So to be very happy to, to talk more with you in the, in the coffee breaks and after this, this table in the answer some questions. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you so thank you so much, uh, Brazil, for for those insights. Uh, we would like now to move to the roundtable session of this event, and uh, I would like to start it off by sharing a bit of insights from Malawi on what we are doing uh, over this issue. So back home in Malawi, we are also experiencing forest loss at an alarming rate of 0.6 percent to 0.7 percent per year, translating to about 15,000 hectares a year, which we are losing. So for us probably unlike other countries, the primary driver of deforestation is lack of cooking and heating energy alternatives. Uh, more than 80% of Malawi's uh, population uh, energy supply comes from biomass with 76.4% of urban and 81.7% rural population using charcoal as a source of cooking energy. Malawi has uh, uh, approximately 11% of the population connected to the grid but only 2% uh, are using electricity. So the impact of deforestation in Malawi has been very devastating. Uh, there's been uncontrollable floods uh, during cyclones leading to deaths of thousands of people. Uh, like in 2022, we had cyclone Ada and Gombe. And just earlier this year, we had a very devastating uh, cyclone Freddy. Uh, this has further exacerbated uh, the load shedding problem, uh, blackouts, and therefore reduced economic activities livestock deaths and therefore livelihoods have been washed away and damaged infrastructure which estimated that at least from this year's cyclone a third of the third one third of the road network in the southern region of malawi was washed out so our assessment has shown that corruption has played a significant role for our state of affairs number one corruption has been key in enabling illegal logging of forest areas due to issuances of logging licenses um, in a corrupt manner, failure to regulate logging of trees from prohibited natural and man-made forest areas due to bribery and influence peddling. Corruption has been a major facilitator in two movement of the illegal charcoal and firewood through roadblocks and police checkpoints. Corruption has resulted into great loss of revenue for Malawi government. Um, the second largest man-made forest in Africa was in Malawi. Uh, we used to call it Chikangawa, but the country failed to manage its harvesting due to many interested corrupt people who obtained logging licenses in corrupt manner and their logging went unregulated. 
the forest area has vanished without much benefit to the country. However, as a country, we haven't just sat down, sitting idle, looking at this problem. We have made some interventions. Uh, so the Anti-Corruption Bureau has put preventative and enforcement programs to deal with corruption in the forest sector through the following strategies. One, we strengthened our law because it used to be very weak. So in 2017, we, we comprehensively amended the Forest Act to provide for stiff penalties for anyone found transporting illegal charcoal and firewood. So since then, there's been quite a number, uh, good number of arrests and impounding of vehicles uh, found transporting these products. And then number two, which also speaks to what Brazil has just presented, is coordinated efforts with other law enforcement agencies through what we call the Interagency Committee on Combating Wildlife Crimes. We have gone this way because we understand the complexity of the sector and secretive, secretiveness of corrupt activities, corrupt activities associated with it. The SCB, the Anti-Corruption Bureau in Malawi, has chosen to work with the Department of Forestry, Malawi Police Service, Financial Intelligence Authority, the Judiciary, Malawi Revenue Authority, and other law enforcement agencies in what is called Interagency Committee on Combating Wildlife and Forestry Crimes. Some of the activities that we do are joint awareness programs, investigations, surveillance, and prosecution of cases. As a result of this collaboration, just last month, we impounded two trucks full of charcoal, arrested nine police officers and forestry officers, and impounded seven, vehicle, uh, seven vehicles. But in the last two years, we've made like really good strides and man managed to get convicted about 900 individuals on forest-related offenses and have about 26 vehicles, which we have had forfeited to the Malawi government. Also, the third point is establishment of the Institutional Integrity Committee in the Forestry Department under the National Anti-Corruption Strategy 2, which Malawi government is implementing and provides for establishment of these IICs. So the Department of Forestry also has one, and uh, uh, these committees are really going all away to all out rather to do awarenesses and do like small scale kind of investigations on forest laws. And also Malawi parliament uh, is in the forefront in ensuring that corruption is fought in the forestry sector. The Malawi parliament Conserva conservation caucus, MPCC, has been very inf instrumental by conducting a comprehensive study on the role of corruption in enabling wildlife and forestry crimes in Malawi. The study has unveiled key risk areas in forestry and wildlife upon which the Bureau is focusing its energy on. Further to that, the Legal Affairs Committee of Parliament is playing a very critical role by monitoring the Institutional Integrity Committees across, but specifically in the forestry uh, section, to make sure that uh, they, are, they are utilizing 1% of their government uh, budget towards the fight against corruption. However, we would like to learn more uh, from other jurisdictions. So at this point in time, I would like to give the floor to Mr. Pierre Bartels, who is a diplomat in the Embassy of Belgium in Vienna, who will represent a new UNODC report launched this week, which is particularly relevant to this session on rooting out corruption and introduction to addressing the corruption fueling forest laws. Over to you, sir. Thank you very much, Martha. Um, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, um, wherever you are. Um, it's, thank you. I'm very honored to, um, to address you today on this very important occasion. Um, I'm also very glad to see that we have a gender balanced panel today. Yes. It's quite important to, to, to underline. Um, it's a pleasure for the government of, of Belgium to formally launch UNODC's publication, Rooting Out Corruption, an introduction um, to addressing the corruption fueling forest loss. This publication was developed with the support of Belgium and to uh, which many of you in this room contributed to, 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 to define. I would like also to express then my, my gratitude for the tremendous work undertaken, and in particular uh, Maria and, and her team. Um, Rooting on Corruption um, is a very comprehensive exploration of the complex interplay between forest loss and, and corruption. Uh, this is a subject of critical importance in our global efforts to preserve forests and mitigate climate change. No matter what form corruption takes in a process aimed at managing and protecting forests, um, the result is a faster and greater depletion of forest cover. This publication aims to provide readers with answers to 
three key questions. Why are forests vulnerable, vulnerable to corruption? Sorry. Second question, what forms does corruption take when linked to forest loss? And third, how anti-corruption tools can be used to mitigate forest loss? Within its pages, you will additionally find case studies, but also examples of good practices to combat this dual threat. It provides not only a diagnostic lens, but also strategic pathways for effective implementation and intervention. It is a very practical document that will help you, that will help us, in our concrete daily fight against corruption linked to deforestation. Furthermore, recognizing also the global significance of these issues in many of our countries we're coming from, UNEDC will launch next year um, and will make this publication available in other languages, namely French, Portuguese and Spanish, expanding also its reach to key regions affected by the, these challenges. In addition, UNODC is also in the process of developing an interactive e-learning course on this topic, making it even more practical and usable. I encourage you to delve into the specific context of this publication to spark discussion um, and foster the implementation of anti-corruption anti tools to prevent forest loss. Now, to save paper um, and their bar forest, this publication is only available online. So I encourage you to scan the QR code that is on these uh, bookmarks that you can find on the tables. I think for the, the, the ones following online, it also appears on, on your screen. Um, and I believe you also have received on the tables um, USB sticks uh, containing the, the document. The Belgian government is committed to deterring uh, corruption as it links to environment crime in general and to forest loss in particular, and in supporting a wide range of initiatives on corruption prevention to preserve nat natural resources. I want you not only to read this publication, but obviously to actively participate in the ongoing dialogue and initiatives it, may, it aims to inspire. Together, we can really forge a path towards sustainable management of forests and integrity in their governments. Thank you. The floor is yours. Thank you very much, Mr. Petros. In the interest of time, I would like now to give the floor to Ms. Keta Kandriana uh, Rafioso, Executive Director, Transparency International Madagascar, who will discuss how corruption fuels environment degradation and forest loss and the work of the Practitioners Forum for Environmental Protection. Over to you. Thank you so much uh, and good morning, dear colleagues. It's a great pleasure uh, for me to be here with you today. Uh, so corruption in the forest sector is widespread uh, and is a critical facilitator of every aspect of uh, forest crime, which is valued upwards to 100 billion of dollars annually. So today uh, I will speak about the work of Transparency International, what we are doing, not only uh, at the national level, but also the international and regional level as my capacity of vice chair of TI. Uh, and I will uh, speak through that to uh, two main lenses and focus. The first one is the corruption in forest climate finance mechanisms an angle that we have been exploring uh, for a few years now and it is very important especially uh, where we are just take over from the COP28 last week and the second angle is uh, the nexus between migration, land, corruption and forest loss. So very briefly on the first aspect, uh, the important role of forest to climate efforts is reflected in a broad range of forest climate finance mechanism but it's often focused uh, on the technical environmental details uh, protecting forest habitats, but corruption can turn well-intentioned initiatives into useless investments and disasters, uh, either directly because funds are embezzled uh, or indirectly because it enables illegal logging, nullifying any positive effects uh, of climate finance initiatives 
Corruption can also make such initiatives an instrument to cause harm to local populations and communities uh, and environment. So in 2021, we conducted a study that looked at forest climate uh, finance flows and examined the governance of forest climate finance in six forest rich countries uh, across the continent, across three continents. So Cameroon, the D DRC, Ghana, Indonesia, Peru, and the Republic uh, of Congo. This report is still available on our website if you are keen to read it. And we are also working uh, on another project with uh, uh, multiple chapters from the five continents on the relationship between, once again, climate finance and the environmental degradation. Uh, so one of the main findings of that report is that TI's corruption perception index seems to be higher in countries uh, where corruption fools, you know, um, forestry loss and uh, illegal logging. So there is a tight linkage between this level of perceived corruption and the destruction of the environment. This demonstrates the weight of forest and environmental corruption on the scale of the overall corruption that affect countries and sometimes entire regions. Um, and then on the second aspect, more at the national scale, I briefly take the example of our work in Madagascar. So we are part of the countering corruption in uh, wildlife trafficking funded by USAID and that we are conducting with WWEF. Uh, traffic and AVG, national, another national coalition in Madagascar. And um, the forest loss in Madagascar, um, it is something really striking. It is huge. You know that Madagascar, for those of you who know the country, it is a hotspot of biodiversity. But it seems that we already lost 80% of our natural areas and uh, we will continue to lose an estimated 200,000 hectares of forest each year, every year. Uh, and then um, it is estimated that in 40 years, nothing will remain in Madagascar. And corruption is one of the drivers of such deforestation. The example of protected areas as Marwan Tsech, uh, from which rosewood trafficking arises, uh, or also the Mena Beant, Mena forest, in which a protected forest is slashed and burned uh, for maize cultivation under the patronage of corrupt officials, are striking and showcase the nexus between migration, itself fueled by extreme poverty, uh, migration, then land corruption as well, and uh, political corruption and related impunity and environmental crime, this nexus is very strong and very hard to break. Um, because even if most of corruption perpetrators in Madagascar are identified uh, and sometimes, you know, put under arrest, uh, the, the low rate of conviction uh, is also another reflection of the striking corruption which prevails in the country. So this impunity is one obstacle to, uh, you know, the alleviation of this scourge. So to conclude with what to do then, uh, if some the, the pictures looks very, you know, uh, dark for now, but there are some solutions. And part of the recommendations that we have identified uh, is to improve the access to information and establishing transparency policies for forest climate finance. It's also about broadening participation of civil society communities and indigenous communities in the forest uh, management, but also the, f the fight against corruption itself, because we cannot pretend to be successful if we don't include communities into the fight. Uh, third recommendation is to enhance independent monitoring and establishing redress mechanisms uh, and with whistleblowers protection to address corruption risks. And on that chapter of uh, whistleblower protection, I would like to say a word to call for uh, in the benefit of the campaign for freeing Gubad Ibadoglu, this uh, Azerbaijani researcher and environmental defender who has been put in, under arrest in Azerbaijan right now, I believe, 
uh, that his son is within the room and can maybe say a few words about that because whistleblower's protection is something crucial if we want to defend the environment and fight corruption we ought to take some you know uh, sustained measures for protecting environmental defenders fourth recommendation is establishing community owned and managed projects and improving land tenure to reduce land use uh, conflicts and deforestation and finally ensuring that forest climate finance contributions are adequate and predictable and achieving equitable benefit sharing and i will call you all to join the practitioners forum that liz already you know bragged about uh, it's a very important initiative uh, and we we are very happy at transparency international to be part of it we need to work together in order to put this forest loss fueled by corruption to an end. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much for that enlightening um, uh, presentation. I think what is striking is the, 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 the link between the CPI score yeah. and the forest loss. I did not know about that. So without much ado, let me now welcome uh, Ms. Erika Hani Chaki, Government Affairs Director at the FACT Coalition which recently published a report entitled Data Money and the Destruction of the Amazon. Erica will share her insights on the illicit financial flows that fuel forest loss. Over to you. Thank you so much, and it's great to be here today. Hi, my name is Erica Hanacek. I work with a group called the FACT Coalition. We're a coalition of more than 100 state, national, and international groups committed to combating harmful, corrupt practices. Uh, a big part of this connects to the environment. Uh, we know this well, that nature, crime, and corruption are not crimes of passion. They are crimes of profit. Uh, and this is exactly why combating illicit finance that fuels forest loss is so crucial uh, and really is a transnational problem that requires international cooperation. I'm sure it's already been mentioned today, but I'll mention one more time uh, that environmental crimes are about worth about $281 billion annually. It's the third most profitable crime in the world. Um, this, that's why initiatives like the Basel Institute's Follow the Money Project are so important. Now, I'm based in the United States, and as we might also guess, a lot of this money finds its way to the global north. Large economies with Swiss cheese-style loopholes in their anti-money laundering system that invite dirty money in, um, and again, fuel these crimes happening uh, in local jurisdictions like in Brazil and other places. Um, so, as was mentioned, we just uh, released a report in October called Dirty Money and the Destruction of the Amazon that looks at how this money finds its way into the United States. Our own Treasury Secretary has said that there's a good case right now that the, that the best place to hide and launder ill-gotten gains is actually the United States. Um, so, let's take a little bit of a look at why illicit finance happens in connection with uh, forest loss and nature crime. Uh, and then let's talk about some of the solutions that we can pursue, uh, both as civil society and governments, uh, to try to tackle this problem. Many in this room might already be familiar with a Financial Action Task Force report that was released in 2021 that specifically looked at this issue and looked at how it's hard for law enforcement to sometimes identify uh, and track the money uh, that comes out of uh, environmental crimes. And first, while these crimes might be easy to define on paper, Sometimes they're hard to define in practice, uh, either in uh, you know being able to identify a specific species of wood that might be uh, you know uh, trafficked out um, as as timber, uh, or uh, you know also including legal definitions. Um, that's quite a challenge. Second of all, they're hard to detect. Sometimes they're in happening in remote locations. Again, sometimes it requires technical knowledge that uh, law enforcement may not be able to have. Uh, they're transnational and require international cooperation. And I am coming from the U.S. context, sometimes we might not be the best at sharing information. Uh, specifically with uh, mutual legal assistance treaties, um, this process can be slow and onerous. And so we want to make sure that there are opportunities that we're actually empowering law enforcement in multiple jurisdictions to be able to incorporate this information to their investigations. And then also that they have the resources to spend their time on what can be complex, years-long investigations into the money. Um, and then lastly, we're obviously talking about corruption uh, this week. Uh, corruption can weaken systems and make it really tough sometimes to be able to, again, catch some of this. Uh, you know, it's convergent crime with forest loss. Uh, so we're not always able to, uh, you know, maybe crack down as hard as we might want to on some of these crimes. 
So as I mentioned, we're looking specifically uh, at how uh, particularly illegal gold mining and uh, forestry crimes in the Amazon are finding their way into the United States. Um, and we've learned a little bit more about how our anti-money laundering loopholes are a magnet for corrupting criminal funds. Uh, the United States is one of the top suppliers of financial secrecy in the world. Um, and we're looking particularly at how, again, in our system, but how we can use this as a lesson more broadly for governments uh, to how to plug some of these loopholes. So I think it was Lisa who mentioned uh, the importance of beneficial ownership registries. Uh, my coalition was actually founded specifically to focus on that in the US about 10 years ago. And we have seen a pretty good pivot in the past uh, 10 to 20 years uh, in adopting beneficial ownership registries worldwide. We're now in a place where 132 jurisdictions have pledged uh, or have implemented their own registries. And we keep, need to keep making process, progress, excuse me, on getting more wins on the board. Um, but again, we talked about the importance of access and sharing this information. Some of these date registers are public, some are not. The United States register that starts on January 1st will not be public. And so uh, it's important that we can make sure that our international law enforcement can continue to use this information for their investigations. Uh, furthermore, the importance of verification to make sure that this data that goes in about the true nat the true owner behind an anonymous entity um, can actually be verified, that you, know, you can actually put together the pieces of the puzzle and that law enforcement has good tools. I also mentioned the importance of plugging our anti-money laundering loopholes, uh, particularly enabler, enablers like uh, real estate professionals, uh, private investment advisors, lawyers, and corporate service providers enable environmental criminals and corrupt officials to take their money out of these jurisdictions and invest them uh, in assets and uh, in you know, investments uh, around the world. And so making sure that these folks have anti-money laundering obligations is key. Thirdly, it's really crucial that environmental crimes are considered a predicate offense for money laundering. Uh, in this FATF report that I mentioned, uh, there was a study of how many jurisdictions have actually taken this step. Uh, and the FATA found that really only jurisdictions that uh, are in destination countries, perhaps in the Amazon or in other places like that, um, have actually taken this step to adopt environmental crimes as a predicate offense, meaning that, uh, envi that prosecutors don't necessarily have the tools, uh, but also that environmental criminals get let off the hook, so to speak, uh, making it, it perpetuating the, uh, the thought that these are high reward, low risk crimes. So pursuing that is really key. And then the last thing that I'll say, and I'll turn it back to the panel, is that it's absolutely crucial that we actually properly resource our law enforcement, our financial intelligence units, and other investigators to tackle these crimes. As I mentioned, that these are a years-long investigation sometimes, and so uh, we want to make sure that we can sustain the momentum forward uh, and to make sure that uh, our folks that are responsible for investigating environmental crime uh, can actually do so. So thank you so much. Back to you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Erica. Um, uh, let me now welcome Ms. Lynn, um, who is the Senior Associate Financial Crime and Corruption, Nature Crime Alliance. Uh, Lynn will highlight the work of the Alliance on tackling financial crimes linked to nature crimes and its role as a multi-stakeholder network. Over to you. Thank you very much. I'm very honored to be on this panel. Um, I would like to uh, give a brief introduction to the work of the Nature Crime Alliance. Um, the Nature Crime Alliance is a relatively new initiative uh, launched in August 2023. And it works uh, as a multi-stakeholder initiative, bringing together different um, stakeholders to bolster operational, um, operational support, raise political will, and um, funding to, um, to tackle nature crimes. It's funded by the US and Norway, and um, uh, the idea is to bring together the different stakeholders that are not usually communicating to, um, to better tackle um, nature crimes. With nature crimes, we are talking about illegal logging, illegal fishing, wildlife crime, illegal mining, and illegal land conversion. The bulk of the operational work, which is what I will focus on today, um, is to develop these working groups like I mentioned, where we would bring together stakeholders that may not communicate to connect the dots in areas um, where, uh, for example, financial crimes linked to nature crimes are difficult to tackle. I will also talk a little bit first about some of the challenges that we've seen in terms of, um, of nature crimes linked to specifically illegal logging. 
So here is an example of a quite a typical, not even a large conglomerate operating in the Asia Pacific region, um, where you can see um, some of the company structures that are operating. Um, this is also uh, a way to kind of identify some of the challenges linked to corruption, um, because you can see that one conglomerate can not only be involved in illegal logging, but many, many different sectors, including mining, real estate, shipping, uh, and the insurance business. And essentially, they're controlling the entire supply chain from uh, the source to the final destination uh, market. Um, this can make it very challenging. Also, risks uh, linked to financial crimes are much more obvious. Um, Interpol estimated that uh, corruption is worth 29 billion a year uh, linked to forestry crimes. Um, and of the biggest of that is, um, is, um, is corruption in, in, in the form of bribery. So in terms of obtaining logging permits in concession areas, but also for obtaining um, security uh, to, for example, um, scare away indigenous peoples uh, to, um, to get access to forestry resources. Also in terms of the shipping, um, bribing customs officials, um, and making sure that the operations run um, from uh, through the supply chain. So it's embedded uh, throughout the supply chain. One of the challenges in terms of uh, corruption being at the start of the supply chain, so obtaining a logging concession illegally through a bribe, is that once you have the permit, the logs um, look, look legal for the rest of the supply chain. So this makes it very challenging when you're operating in a destination market to identify uh, whether the logs are legal or illegal, which is something that I think many panelists have already discussed, is the mixing of legal with illegal timber. Um, also, at the final destination market, you can see uh, corruption being an issue because some of the mills might accept logs at a lower value, which are illegal, um, compared to um, following the legal uh, supply chain. So these are some of the challenges that we're seeing now. What is the Nature Crime Alliance aiming to do uh, to support uh, its members, which are um, governments, um, but also uh, international organizations and police organization like Interpol is a member, uh, Transparency International and EIA are also members to bring together um, these different stakeholders to, um, to, to better communicate in ways of tackling nature crimes. In, um, it, Looking at financial crimes, uh, we have several initiatives ongoing already, including um, a UNODC um, Nature Crime Alliance Global Dialogue, which meets on a global uh, on a quarterly basis and is chaired by the global head of financial crime and compliance of Santander Bank. Uh, we have 42 global banks which are participating in this dialogue and 30 national authorities and we bring in subject matter experts to also um, bring in intelligence on, on, on key issues um, that are um, timely and of relevance. Um, the outcomes of this is that at the moment, which was also highlighted in the FATF report on money laundering from environmental crime, is that the number of suspicious transaction reports and suspicious activity reports uh, linked to uh, nature crimes is extremely low still. But financial institutions, uh, private sector are sitting on a lot of intelligence and information um, and law enforcement as well. And the sharing of information is, is a huge challenge. So one of the way of bridging the gaps is to bring together these different experts in a forum um, where they can exchange information and also discuss new initiatives and challenges uh, that they face for uh, better detecting um, these financial crimes. It's also a platform where, um, where it's possible to present uh, initiatives and, and use tools such as Global Forest Watch, which is a tool of WRI, which hosts the Secretariat uh, of the Nature Crime Alliance, to uh, use satellite imagery to detect um, illegal deforestation and, um, and, and financial crimes associated with illegal deforestation. Uh, some of the financial institutions are using this platform as well. The outcome of these dialogues is to improve detectability, improve collaboration, and ultimately increase the number of suspicious transaction reports and, and, SAR, and suspicious activity reports on, on nature crimes um, to ultimately um, increase deterrence and, and reduce um, the ability of, of criminals to uh, make such a huge profit uh, in this industry sector. 
Um, we work on many different working groups. This is just the example of the financial crimes uh, angle. Uh, we also work on indigenous peoples, investigative journalism, tools and technology. And it, I would encourage you to um, come see us uh, after this uh, session uh, where we can tell you more about the Alliance and also how to join this new initiative. Thank you. Thank you so much, Lynn. So in the interest of time, we may not go into questions because we are already over our allocated time. But as you may be aware, Norway is an important player in tackling illegal deforestation, funding programs such as the UNODC Interpol Law Enforcement Assistance Program, as well as the Nature Crime Alliance, and by providing important tools and technology that are transforming the fight against nature crime. I would therefore like to welcome Mr. Mats Benestad, Policy Director, Minister of Foreign Affairs, Norway, to provide the closing remarks for this event. Over to you, sir. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. And I have summarized the question and answer as my first uh, brackets here. But, uh, so let me just start by thanking the organizer of this um, event uh, and to all speakers here today for sharing their insightful uh, knowledge on this important topic. I think we can agree that uh, the panelists have given us an idea how multifaceted this crime is. Brazil, which we are all aware is home to a large part of the world's biggest rainforest and representatives from Brazil offered us a very good case study of the importance of institutional cooperation in fighting environmental crime related corruption. Brazil is also a leading example in reducing illegal deforestation. Since Brazil began its reforms, forest reforms about 15 years ago, Brazil has made reductions of about 5 billion tons of CO2 from reduced def deforestation. And this is, uh, listen, listen to this, this is equivalent to about 90 years of Norwegian emissions. So this is extremely important. And at the COP28, the Norwegian government provided an additional 50 million US dollar to the Amazon fund. And over the last 15 years, we have provided 5 billion US dollar to, to um, saving the world's tropical forests. So I was also impressed by the work you're doing in Malawi, uh, and also to the civil society representatives here, your work and as our partners, that's also invaluable. Uh, the speakers today have touched on the gravity of organized and large-scale forest crime. And we are not just talking about a few trees being cut illegally. We're talking about one of the largest illicit economies in the world. I think you mentioned the third lar largest. Um, an economy that is closely interlinked with financial crime, human rights abuse, and trade in other illicit goods such as drugs. An equally alarming large-scale illicit deforestation contributes greatly to global biodiversity and the climate crisis. Deforestation accelerates CO2 emissions into the atmosphere, causes by massive destruction of habitats, spread of disease, and unstable weather patterns, which in turn affects agriculture and ecosystems. Corruption is an effective enabler for this illegal business. We must go after those that enable corruption related to envi environmental crime and deforestation. And this is essential because deforestation must be curbed if we are to meet our global climate and diversity, biodiversity goals. The FACT Coalition made an interesting intervention on how corruption fuels environmental degradation and pointed to how money from this illicit trade is laundered into the global legal economy. Without proper financial control, proceeds from environmental crime are easily transferred among jurisdictions through shell companies, secrecy jurisdictions, with assistance of professional enablers. Because environmental crimes are interlinked with other serious forms of crime, they must also be addressed across sectors of the government. Norway is supporting many international initiatives, either in bilateral partnerships or with go other governments or through multilateral partners with expertise in this field, such as the United Nations Office on Drugs and Crime and Interpol. But governments and law enforcement 
cannot do it alone. Civil society play a key role. Norway supports investigative journalists in their efforts to expose environmental crime and other civil society organizations and indigenous frontline defenders. And I'm also adding whistleblowers, uh, key in this, in this efforts. And we, the state parties, are discussing resolutions on that topic at this conference. So that is very, very important also to, to my uh, country. We also support the development and of technology and transparency tools to better and more easily expose illegal deforestation and with it the corruption that en enables the illegal deforestation. One such initiative is the Nor Norwegian International Climate and Forest Initiative Satellite Program. This program provides free access to high resolution satellite data of the tropics. The data is being used by law enforcement, researcher, indigenous groups, and civil society organizations, and you and me when we search for locations in the tropics through Google Earth Engine. A final initiative that I would like to point to is the Nature Crime Alliance. The alliance, which was launched in August of this year, is a global multi-sectoral initiative that welcomes governments, civil society, law enforcement, and funders to come together and find good solutions in fighting nature crime and converging crime such as corruption. We hope to see more partners joining this alliance. Combating corruption and illicit financial flows related to illeg illegal logging more efficiently is essential for developing countries to mobilize domestic resources for sustainable development. We recognize the efforts made to promote a resolution on environmental crime ahead of this Conference of the States parties. Norway was ready to support such a resolution if it had been presented, but timing was maybe not right before this conference. We will continue to work in this field and we look forward to discussing with all interested parties a possible resolution for the next Conference of the State parties. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Mr. Benestad, for the closing remarks. And uh, thank you, the whole panel, for making this side event quite insightful. And for the audience, thank you for participating. Once again, thank you.